All right. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, that's good. So, as I told you, I will do a quick intro of you. I will try. And you can, you can correct me if I say something wrong. You have to. Uh, so, you, you actually co-founded Moleco Partners 2004. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> got um, the first one right. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and you've been, so you're now CEO since uh, 2016. If I'm correct, you're actually the most successful, biggest co biotech company here in Zurich. Yeah, uh, I will <laughs> not disagree. <laughs> um, yeah, and you're developing a new class of, of drugs in oncology and ophthalmology. You have several programs, most advanced in, in phase three, and your whole uh, platform, platform company yes. based on the DARPINs, which has those uh, proteins, so 10 times smaller than an antibody, basically with the binding regions, and you're developing that into the clinics. Yeah? Correct so far. <laughs> cool. And and I promised I would challenge you a bit, so uh, fair, fair. I will try. No, so to start with, I think um, interestingly, I mean, you, you have really advanced an advanced program, uh, basically in, in phase three and collaboration with Allegan, and I think you recently announced good news, uh, positive phase three results. Yes. So can you talk a bit about that? Were you were you satisfied with the results, and was it what you expected, or did you expect anything more? So we're talking about the visit part, that's a phase three asset we have, it's a monodarpin. we started to develop that 2007. Yeah. Molecular Partners brought a visit part into the clinics, we did our first phase one, and the idea is it's a long-acting anti-VETCHEF, so it blocks VETCHEF in the eye, and in diseases they're called wet AMD and DME, people go blind because actually VETCHEF causes blood vessels to be leaky and the retina to detach. Yeah. So what we were looking for is to block VETCHEF, to restore vision in these patients. And we started um, really back in 2007-ish by engineering the half-life of abisipar in the eye to be a long-acting drug. So all the activities were gauged, which we were doing to show that we would need less injections than current treatments on the market, and you have a few very good ones there. So Lucentis is the standard of care of Roche and Novartis, and the more recent Ilea of Regeneron. And they're, they're actually given a, by a treat and extend mode. So what you do is you dose a patient, and the patient comes back after a certain amount of time. And this is usually a month or two months, and in some cases, three months. And we were trying to develop a drug that could be dosed in every patient every three months. And so last year we got... And this works. This works. <laughs> so a big applause to our team actually that it works. So we could show that we had developed the first anti vetchef that really was able to, in a randomized large trial led by Allergan, to work in all patients actually with a three monthly fixed dosing scheme. So we were really happy that that hold up. I mean, we had phase two results, but it was a phase three. There was a little side remark to that, and it is that um, the manufacturing process is not or was not yet ideal. So we also picked up a level of inflammation in these patients that was around 10 to 15 percent at that time. I think it was 15 percent in that clinical trial. So that was on the high end, but we were not surprised. I mean, you asked, were you surprised yeah. about the outcome? We were not so surprised. Uh, we had hoped to be lower, but we had expected it. And so Allergan, with our support, had developed a novel manufacturing process that they are now, uh, have now tested. And so we have, were able to halve the level of inflammation. So we're really on track to bring the first fixed 12-week drug into the wet AMD market. So yes, we were what very happy. When the bring on the market? Then? What's the so next step? The Allergan is in control of this, so yeah. they have communicated to stick to their timelines. That's uh, BLA submission first half of this year. <laughs> Approval can be 12 months after, so next year. Okay. So big, big moment for us. That's good. And um, 
on the um, so you said Alagan is in, in charge of of the development. So Correct. On the how, how does it split on the commercial side of things? Like, will you take care of part of it, or will they take care of everything? <laughs> will you become actually a commercial biotech or not yet? Not yet. <laughs> so. Uh, we're n so Allergan is paying for all the trials and running all the trials. Mm -hmm. So we're only at the moment moral supporters and content supporters, but they are running the trials. They are an ophthalmology engine yeah. and you have to see it's also commercially now a crowded space. So you need an expert there to really do the best for marketing. Yeah. And uh, they are a global organization. They're developing this drug um, throughout the world in parallel. We as a smaller biotech could not have yeah. really done a big chunk of that in this indication. So for us, it was a decision that we took back in 2010, yeah. so not okay. so recently, um, that we would use Abyssipar as a showcase for the DARPINs, that it works, and then partner with an expert in the field. And then for us, as you just mentioned, it's, it, it has a cash incentive. So we have milestones. We actually have 360 million in open milestones in this drug, plus double digit royalties mm -hmm. and up to the mid teens. So we, we still have very nice economic value in the drug. Mm -hmm. And we reapply that to invest in our pipeline that is now more in oncology. Y you make a perfect transition to my <laughs> Okay, <laughs> then I'll leave you to, to ask the, the question. Yeah, yeah. On, on the, I mean, on the pipeline, you, even on the on the website, you define yourself as oncology company, even though the oncology is not your most advanced product. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> talk a bit more on the on the oncology. Like, what's yeah, what's your most advanced progr program on there? What's your own pipeline versus? I think you have a collaboration with Amgen. So, yes. So How so. I'll go just a bit back in history and I was just kind of reaching out 2010. We decided it was a conscious decision that we would uh, partner ophthalmology. One reason was that we did not know which other programs would be really good there. And there were actually quite some failures on other targets in ophthalmology. So that was a good decision. And we had at that point in time developed the DARPINs to also work systemically. So to be injected into the bloodstream of a human and have a systemic activity. And that opened the door for systemic applications. At the time, we also had a collaboration with J&J &J, uh, for immunology, and, and we were developing our pipeline in oncology. What happened with them? Uh, the J&J &J collaboration, um, we were working in pulmonary, yeah. and they stopped their pulmonary disease area stronghold, and those projects were shelved. Okay. It was a big learning for us that we need to control what we're doing. And it also led to the clear understanding that we need to bring programs into the clinics, ideally to proof of concept before partnering, okay. as we can then secure the value. But you were asking about oncology. Yeah. so. The idea of the DARPINs is that we can do multi-specific. So we can attack multiple disease-promoting agents at once. And cancer is a complex disease with a very high medical need. Yeah. And so this idea of bringing a team to fight cancer on the molecular level made a lot of sense. Medical need was there. And so that's where we decided to go into oncology. Yeah. The most advanced program is MPO250. That's in phase one, two development. So it's in multiple myeloma and non-small cell lung cancer. Then we have a HER2 this targeting. One you, didn't, you didn't partner this one? You this is all unpartnered. Yeah. Then we have a HER2 targeting agent, MPO274. That's in HER2 positive cancers in phase one. Mm -hmm. And then we have, and this is really exciting, and I hope we have some time to talk about it, is our earlier pipeline in immune oncology, mm -hmm. where we're trying to use the DARP to cause a local inflammation in the tumor to activate immune cells, but only in the tumor and nowhere else in the body. We call this a tumor local switch that now can be much stronger than conventional approaches to use immune oncology to bring it to the next level and allow combination treatments there. And that's our program <laughs> called MPO310. That's a local T cell stimulator, tumor local T cell stimulator that we now partnered with Amgen. Okay. That's a, no, that's a good description. And um, on, on Amgen, is it, so I guess it's a super early program. So 
but you said you always wanted to bring it to proof of concept before partnering. So what, what happened there? <laughs> you, you're listening really well. <laughs> <That's my So job. laughs> I know it's, it's, a, it's a very good question, one we debated long. So first, um, what 310 does on a molecular level is it activates T cells in the tumor. We don't believe activating T cells is going to be quite enough. We think we have to combine it ideally with a T cell engager. And Amgen is the world leader on T cell engagers. So it made a lot of sense to, to talk to them about it. And others were also interested. So for the molecule, it made sense. And in the deal we did, we also agreed that we will bring it into the phase one. So we're running phase one clinical trials and we'll hand over for the combination. So we kept a bit true to our half-half. Uh, half, half. <laughs> and it just made sense because you also have to think to give this molecule a fair chance, you'll have to test several combinations. So ideally not with one, but with two or three and, uh, and other uh, um, compounds. And we don't have those. So we would have to kind of have partnerships with all individual companies for these combinations. And we would have alone not have been in a position to give this molecule the best chance. And then we revert to one of our core values is create patient value. And we found that for this program, a collaboration is a better way to do so than to, do, to go alone. Yeah. So having said that, we'll, uh, we have other programs we want to bring forward alone, yeah. but we'll always revert back to a guiding principle where is the patient value. Okay, no, that makes sense. And um, when we go more to Darpins, I mean, you mentioned it quickly and I mentioned it quickly as well, but maybe in, in one or two sentences, what, what makes him so special? Like, So what makes him special is that this was nature's design for multi-specificity. So in nature, DARPINs were evolved to anchor other proteins somewhere. So they work in a multi-domain context. They're 15 kilodaltons, one domain, one specificity. They're often compared to antibodies. Antibodies is four different proteins in 12 domains for one specificity. And so we use DARPINs for what they were de evolved by nature to do, which is multi-specific binding. You take any given target, we select a specific binder, and then we use this DARPIN module as a Lego-like building block to build a drug. And so in the end, what we want to have is a toolbox of DARPINs that we can mix and match with different linkers to actually create I call this a molecular team to fight a specific disease. Mm -hmm. And I like 310, I'll go back to that, where we have one. It's more than two sentences. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think examples just help. So <laughs> on the one hand, you have go one DARP pin that binds a tumor local cluster, and yeah. then you have a, uh, an agonist target on a T cell. And so if you just bind the T cell, you have, you have no clustering. If you just bind the clustering, you have no T cell engagement. Only if you have both, you have clustering and T cell activation. That can only happen in the tumor. So it's a switch. Mm. And to build such Which can approaches, do simil similar with an antibody. I mean, it's not so easy. So the checkpoint there inhibitors, is it's basically what yes, a checkpoint inhibitor is. You just have to block a checkpoint inhibitor to mm. unblock the system. But a nice example is is, is 310 because of Hoffman La Roche. So and Genentech, they have a similar program, but they had to take the natural ligand and hook it up to a full antibody, mm. which is highly complex. And for us, it's literally taking two of our modules, putting it together. We can screen literally 10,000 of combinations for ideal linkers, ideal binders to find the perfect team for a specific solution. And so, so I think that's where our strengths come in. And what's the drawback then? You, you mentioned toxicity or manufacturing. <laughs> so <laughs> manufacturing is really straightforward for for it should be easier than an antibody. I mean, it, it should be. It is mi microbial. They're highly stable, so yeah. it is very fast and very easy. Yes, this helps. Um, the the from what we know from our clinical trials is that they are immunogenically silent, so they don't cause a huge immune reaction if injected into humans. The toxicity always comes from the biological activity they carry. Okay. So, so it is, I would say, on a neutral case, but we can do more complex architectures. And I think we don't try to compete directly with antibodies, but to open a novel therapeutic design space that is not accessible for antibodies. So let's compete with what is already good, but do things where the limitations today are. No, that's good. 
Um, I will open up for questions just after that one. <laughs> um, I will switch a bit more to the, to the finance to the finance side. I, mean, I looked at your stock price. <laughs> I'm a shareholder uh, too, so, <laughs> <laughs> so. You, you know what I mean. I uh, know what you mean. So mm. I don't have the graph on the slide, but basically, it basically half compared to one month mm. after the IPO. Yep. So, and and actually pretty. I mean. But the market cap is actually pretty low for for yes. by the company with a phase three and with such a promising yeah. early stage oncology pipeline. So what's wh what's what's uh, what's your or like why is that? What's um I, I think the explanation is rather straightforward. It is with the power and goes back to my story of the inflammation. Mm. At this point in time, you have a lot of investors and analysts that follow Allergan and are skeptical around this program mm. about the commercial viability of this program. Not is it going to come to market, but is it commercially viable with the inflammation? And I think this is a binary and in a way. Get enough royalties and my stuff exactly. And so, <laughs> and I think what is underestimated at the moment is that we we actually will get most of those milestones no matter how good the uh, commercial value of, of Abyssipar is. So we're quite relaxed on that. But I think the investors have to kind of get past that to actually then see a bit in the shadow of Abyssipar mm -hmm. our oncology work that is really undervalued in my eyes of attention because when we meet people, they want to talk about the phase three of Abyssipar. And this is something you can talk to other companies that have one lead product that is far along and an earlier pipeline. The focus is always on the most advanced molecule. And I think there is just two ways to, 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 to conquer that. One is just obviously that that moves on. Yeah. And we are working super hard to bring forward our oncology assets oh, you and give him the showcase. And uh, I'll go back to the three. You could cut it completely to face screen and sell it earlier to other again. Absolutely. And I think that's a model people have done. Okay. And we also obviously looked into uh, the ability of doing this. This is possible. And uh, at this point in time, not necessary, but obviously an option. Because okay. I guess this makes it challenging for you so to present yourself. Are you an ophthalmology company? Are you an oncology company? And what, what are you <laughs> at the end? Like? No, we're an oncology company. So I think what we realized through our history is that if we don't pioneer also the biology and the medical side of this, the DARP pins will remain a tool that might be used or not used. So we realized that we have to pioneer novel therapeutic designs ourselves. And then we had to make a conscious decision where to go. And we decided to go into oncology. And that's where we're heading now. So okay. we're definitely an oncology company. Um, the DARP pins is platform is broader, so there is an interesting discussion to have to spin out other assets, to, to start joint ventures, to do large collaborations. So there is potential for, for deal flow there, for investments there. You've but worked for another decade. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I have to clone myself <laughs> <laughs> to, to do more. And I think this, I, I'm sure we will see more. No, that's good. And um, I saw your previous chairman, so Jan Aldak was, he just bought his company to the Nasdaq. Will you, will you do the same as well? <laughs> That's a very good question. So our take on the US is that we, we want to forward integrate as molecular partners. So we at, the, at one point in time want to sell our own products. And if you think that through, this will most likely happen in the US. So what you'll also have to do is build a late stage or early stage clinical development group. And we're starting to do that now in the US. And so that's kind of our focus to the US. And if everything is there, we also can play the card of one's listing there as a financial tool, but we don't have to. So okay. I think we're neutral. Um, there's very nice examples like Arginix, Galapagos, Morphosis. So you have a very nice group of companies who paved that way. Mm. And I wouldn't say no, but it's not on the top of our US plans. It's definitely first to set up um, also the clinical work there. Yeah, And I guess you needed to collaborate with Amgen as well. I mean. Sure. Sure, I mean, it's it's good to be close. And also, the having the platform and having all the pipeline we're moving, we will need more collaborations. Mm. So we actually have a Boston office now, and it's good to be there and to be close to the other biotechs and pharma to also inspire others to use our, 
our technology. It's a very nice city to live in as well. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? I will please just raise your hands. Okay, don't be don't be shy. Here's one. Simple question. What are your plans for Asia? Um, for Asia. So what are our Asian plans? So at this point in time, we have no activities in Asia. Uh, we're obviously aware of um, a lot of deal flow from there. So on the business development side, we're following very closely a lot of regional deals that are happening in mostly China, I would say, but also in Asia in a, a broader sense. So I think Asian deals are, are of interest to us. Um, then we there is investors who are, are very active uh, in the Asian space. Our focus at the moment is the US, but we're obviously following what's going on in Asia, especially for business development. And Europe and US is already a big... Yeah, <laughs> and, and it's if big you're a cover. small biotech, you also one one mantra has to be focus. If you start to do m too many things and you do dilute yourself, you definitely lose traction. So it, I think that's the one thing I can share with everyone here. So if you are in a small biotech, try to focus on one or two things and do them right in, instead of doing too many things. And we decided on the US. We could have also went another way, but for us it was the US. Yep. And then in the back. Yeah. You spoke a lot about the platform concept. Uh, would you still consider um, using uh, the DARPINs intracellularly? Um, that's a very good point because that's what we started out to do. So when we started uh, working on the DARPINs, we thought they would be ideal intrabodies. And I think they still are because they have no disulfide bonds, they're very stable, they're small, single domain. So if um, somebody solves the delivery conundrum, we will be the first to partner with that company to, to do intrabodies on DARPINs. And I think we have seen interesting approaches there. I think the whole viral delivery is making good progress. We have gene therapy that can deliver proteins. We have cell therapies, so, so CAR Ts are alike, where you could use DARPINs in, as intrabodies. So I see more movement there. So far, we have no internal activities on intrabodies. Um, when you started your, the company, did you already aim to be a, a, an oncology-focused company and you were just using wet AMD as a strategic indication? Um, no, no. at the time we, we literally did not have the plan at that time to become an oncology company. I think we we first want to test, I mean, one, like, first things first, can we create DARPINs? And the ophthalmology product was the fastest way to proof of concept. You have to think, you inject that product into the eye of a patient, and literally the next day you can read efficacy because this person can read the paper again while he was more or less blind before. So you have an instant readout. And that was one reason why we took uh, the ophthalmology asset first, because we needed to first understand does it work. And then it was a deepening of understanding of our platform and of the therapeutic space where it fits best together, and that led to oncology. So we, uh, we could not have known when we started the company. That's a good, good question. I have, a, I have a actually, I will come back to you. <laughs> can, I, can I ask one? It's on, on the same topic, and then I come to yours. So, on, on the on the, I had a question on. It's been it's been a while now. It's been 15 years. It's, it's I mean, biotech is really a, a long game. Like, did you did you know that when you started? I think this we do. Yes, we didn't know that we would want to become an oncology company, but we always um, were in for the sustainable long-term patient value. Mm. And we had in our close proximity other examples of early buyouts that then stopped, so we always knew we would not want to go for a fast trade sale. Mm. And this part we knew, and we knew it's a marathon and not a sprint, and that allows you also to think long-term and design what you do a bit more long-term because you have to um, 
think it through to the end. Can you can you go a bit deeper on why why do you think long term is the best choice for for you as a founder, for the patients, for your shareholders? I think it starts with the patients. So I think that's why um, I can because we talked about it um, before in our collaboration with Janssen. We had great molecules that were then stopped for a strategic reason. So if you don't control that you don't control it. So that was a, a lesson we learned along that way. And it was, we obviously got funding that we could then use again. So it was definitely a very fruitful collaboration, very good collaboration, but it didn't bring patient value. And, th and that's where we measure our success. And I think that's where, I think we as a team always were very true to this. And um, Sometimes it is a partnership. We could not do a business part without Allergan. Sometimes you do the best yourself. And I think if you look at the whole landscape, why is biotech as strong as it is? Because that's where innovation happens. And that's why we are biotech. And I think I hope we have many other biotechs here that drive innovation and drive new things and take risks and fail and stand up again. And, and that's, that's our business model. And pharma can definitely help us do that and then bring these products that are successful forward. C can you give some examples of why, why you are true to patients? Because everyone says that, every biotech says that, even pharma say that. Uh, I mean, wh what, what makes you <laughs> really true to patients? Yeah, so, so I, I, I can start with the founding group. So I think we were all scientists that came together and I think you write these grants early on. I do this research because I believe this once can help a patient. And I don't know, you have to look then in the mirror and say, is this really true or I'm just writing a grant to get money? And I think that group of people we were then could all look in the mirror and say that. And then our history, and I'll add a bit of personal anecdote here, is very touching as our former CEO, he passed away to cancer. And so voice is a bit trembling, but mm. this is highly emotional for us. I mean, we have one of our team members we lost to this disease. Oh. And so I can definitely say that this is my driving force mm. and uh, we will not stop. Yes. Yes, yes. Go for it, I yeah. promise. <laughs> um, so, Patrick, I would be keen to understand a bit more your thoughts about location, Zurich. <coughs> so it took La Biotech, what, like 14 meetings to come to Zurich? 14, yeah. 14 meetings to come to Zurich. And I think generally, like when you look at the European biotech landscape, Zurich isn't like in the, in the top ranks. So you decided to stay while most startups, most biotechs at one point move out of Zurich. So what's great about Zurich as a location and what's missing? So we, we started obviously in Zurich because we, we come from the university. We all studied at the ETH. So I think that's the moment to say that these are great institutions to do research in. So I think we have a good talent pool there. So in Zurich. Um, then we have here in Schlieren, we have um, an investment from different landlords into lab space. So you can build labs, you can build teams. And we also luckily over the last years have a nice track record of success um, stories. Let me start with Glycart that was trade sold to, to Roche. Their CD20 antibody is, is on the market. Um, Pablo and his gang are still powering hard next to us and I think they're filling the Roche pipeline very successfully. So that's a great driver we have. I think the next in class was Espatec, that they were trade sold to Novartis. They, their antibody fragment is going to go on the market, I hope, this year. Would they get sold earlier if they were in Basel and not in Zurich? They were always, <laughs> they, they actually are, were always here. No, they they were in, in, in Zurich. So, and and then would they be acquired even faster if they were in Basel <laughs> and maybe, not in Zurich? <laughs> maybe, but we can discuss if acquisition is good or bad. <laughs> These are, and then we have um, Covagen, uh, maybe the youngest to those uh, trade sales that were trade sold to J and J. Um, so, so I think we have a, a nice history of success. Um, we have public market investors here and in Basel. I mean, and Zurich and Basel, we're not that far apart. So I, I don't see that um, as, as a difference. What you do have more here is maybe more ideas coming from academia. While in Basel with Roche and Novartis, you actually have many more 
let's say, product candidates that are dropped or don't have the attention and are spun out. So it's a different phenotype of types of companies you see. Um, having said what I just said, I mean, if you start earlier, if you start with an idea, it takes you longer to bring it to the clinic and into clinical proof of concept. So I, I, I would say Basel has a, 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 an advantage in where they can start. I guess you also have a lot of talent in those large pharmas that wants to go out and start own companies. So it's also a great place. But I, I personally don't see a big difference. I mean, I, I would even suggest that commuting one hour in the US would be seen as actually a short commute. <laughs> and if you're in Boston and you are at Kendall Square and you have your company at Waltham where all biotechs are, it's a 90 minute commute and the cities keep the roads bad because they don't want people not to do it. <laughs> so it's quite an interesting battle happening there. But having said that, uh, I, I would really cluster Switzerland together. I'm also in the Swiss Biotech Association, and I think we should work together. I think we have both strengths and bring it together and, and make a good story here. And when you started, you didn't have base launch. No, we didn't. Now <laughs> it's much cooler. <laughs> That's good. Have time for one last question. Yeah, please. Is your microbial process a gain or a burden? I mean, in the sense, you and, for example, Applings uh, are using a microbial process, or at least not a chose uh, process. Mm -hmm. Can you use that as a differentiator, eventually also as a cost differentiator? To tell you the truth, I was yesterday at a hospital, at a cancer hospital, and the patient receiving a checkpoint inhibitor said uh, it's not in reimbursed, it costs 9,000 euro per month. And sooner or later, the party might come to an end where the cost pressure, at least in the US or maybe in Europe, will, will become bigger. So can you use that eventually to differentiate? And, and, and also about these issues with the uh, I, I wouldn't call it toxicity, but in the production process. Is, so the question again, is a microbial process a gain or uh, a burden? I, I would say at the moment it's still a neutral because a lot of that is done is uh, mammalian, so you have to set up larger um, process development teams. So, so our process development team had to, or it, we have a quite large process development team, but the process and the production itself is then more cost effective than a, than a mammalian production. I think what you also nicely pointed out that the, the cost schemes, especially in oncology, are, are reaching a limit and that we cannot price at any price. And at one point in time, cost of goods will be a differentiator. And that's where microbial productions will have a big gain. But the field is also going in another direction where you have CAR T cells and other cell therapies that are going in a totally different direction on the cost of good side. So, so I think we, we definitely see, see both. At the moment, we are very happy with the microbial approach and um, it definitely will help us in the long run. That's good. Maybe a, a last question, more long one to, to finish up. How long, how longer do you see yourself run the company? That's a very good question. So <laughs> I've been with the company since we started and I, I've really not have a, had a single boring day since we started it. So I'm CEO now, I'm enjoying myself, I'm enjoying working with a great team. I mean, that, that's maybe one of the key motivations in this industry. You can work with incredible individuals on the management team, on the board of directors, but also all our co-workers and to with them actually develop drugs that make a difference for patients is something most rewarding you, you can think of. And then to see the pipeline develop and to build a sustainable organization. I mean, how could I stop my job? So at least <laughs> 15 more years. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much, Patrick. Please, a round of applause for him.